The pandemic got us into a reflective space and made us look inward to see what we can do for the world at large. As a self-expression coach, I became a catalyst for women and started Vani, a one-on-one coaching program for women on finding their voice, to speak up, to be visible. As a storyteller, I spotted that there were many ordinary people amongst us leading extraordinary lives, making a difference to the world, and they needed to be heard. Thus was born You and I with Rashmi Shetty, where amazing personal journeys with their uniqueness and individuality are showcased. A reaffirmation of the fact, open your eyes wider, the world is far more beautiful when we acknowledge the presence of both you and I. Our guests today are Dr. Prakash and Chaitra Sontakke. Chaitra is a vocalist, performer, teacher, mentor, equally at ease with Hindustani classical as well as bhajan, Sufi and fusion music. Presently with the Shankar Mahadevan Academy, she is someone who is born in a music-loving family and her interest in music was nurtured by her grandmother. She later went on to become a student with Dr. Srimati Mani Sontake and Dr. R.B. Sontake. Currently, she's pursuing her PhD in music. Dr. Prakash Sontake is a vocalist, multi-instrumentalist, composer, director, filmmaker, innovator, motivational speaker and traveler. A co-composer, vocalist and guitarist on the Grammy-winning album Winds of Samsara and the only Indian to have won the Independent World Music Awards USA and the National Award for Composers, where his composition was chosen over that of the maestro Eli Raja, is a special moment. Recently, his music for the documentary on Kashi Vishwanath Corridor was shared by the Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi himself. Listen in as they talk about how beautifully art and life blend and how music plays such a beautiful role in their lives. Such a pleasure having you, Chaitra, in this uh, journey with Prakash Ji along with you. Welcome to you and I with Rashmi Shetty. This for me is an honor hosting the two of you. I've always noticed what a beautiful blend both of you are when it comes to music. And uh, you're so together that I could not think of a conversation with you individually. And I thought I'll invite both of you together for this journey. So you take us where you want to take us and we will just come along with you and listen. My memories go back to my grandmother singing. So Mm -hmm. she used to be singing all the time, even while she's doing some work and um, sitting in front of God and maybe lighting a lamp and then singing. In the evening, we used to sing bhajans. So that is where I started. So she taught me the first notes and first song. Uh, And then formally, I started learning. So that's where I started my musical journey. And... uh, uh, yeah, formal learning, I think, happened much later. The formal learning started when I was in my sixth standard. Yeah, does Chaitra, because the Chaitra I know is a quiet, smiling Chaitra. Joy is never beyond a smile. I've never seen you excited or anything. I've only seen you calm and smiling all the time. Is there a Chaitra who sings when Chaitra is happy? Uh, who hums all the time. What is Chaitra behind that teacher the world knows? I think in my classes and my students know me better as a person outside. uh, I think in outside situations where there is a show going on, especially when the students are performing. So that's, uh, I think, where most of you all have seen me. So... I wouldn't be the joyous self un- unless, you know, maybe at the later or end of the day when I'm having a quiet time with my students. So uh, that's only a part of me. 
and um, yeah it's a lot of responsibility because you are uh, putting these children up there on stage and you have to make sure that they're comfortable first yes. so performance wise practice yes they would have put in their efforts but what happens there you know whether they're nervous or not they uh, make sure that they're all happy and you know mm-hmm. i think that is something that keeps me occupied keeps okay. me occupied but when I what brought you into the teaching space chaitra uh, from being somebody who was initiated by your grandmother getting into formal music not thinking about it as a career but just doing it for the joy what brought you into teaching uh when you learn classical music um teaching i think comes as a part of the guru shishya parampara that's what i believe in hmm. and uh, probably that's how the tradition has carried forward for so long mm. in spite of no no proper documentation like we all know that we don't uh, we have all the you know documentation in bits and pieces from the say ancients mm. so it's only the guru shishya parampara so there is an element of teaching in the tradition itself that is one thing first point Hmm. uh secondly i think a teacher is somebody who thinks or thinks about others and that should come naturally <laughs> when you know uh i think in my family there is a natural thing of you know my father he runs a school hmm. academic school and uh always seen him you know worrying about others or how to um uh how to do good hmm. how to contribute to the society that we are in because i come from a small uh place called kalasa mm. in karnataka I mean, I, now it is no no more a small <laughs> town it, it's kind of grown yes in karnataka in chikmagalur okay uh, okay tornado huh. so uh, it was the only english medium school that he is running it's hmm. running till today so all the children around those places used to come and he had one small hostel and he used to kind of make sure that those children who could not afford education also would come to school hmm. and uh, that is that inspires you you know to kind of get into education in that space okay. so i kind of combined both uh i mean it, it just it just happened in a flow i would say mm-hmm. and even in my guru parampara my guruji and um, prakash's mother i um, is called her auntie all the always <laughs> so uh, both of them also are inspiring so when they are like inspiring teachers as well so when they teach they kind of forget themselves so mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it just happened in a flow by looking at all these uh, people around me and with whom i grew up okay okay now now i know <laughs> where the humility comes from and where the giving back more than taking in comes in from wow okay I and pra- what i do is just a part of what all of them have done <laughs> so it's my small uh, very humble mm. attempt <laughs> yeah that's very beautifully said chaitra and uh, very typical of you i i cannot expect another answer from you so yes it uh, perfectly fits into the chaitra sutake that i know and uh, prakash ji what about you i don't remember any point of time where there was a concept of formal training because uh, i grew up uh, with um, like children have toys to play with i had so many instruments around the house because my mother used to play so many instruments so there were instruments around the house so we didn't even realize when we understood all those things that we understood and um, i don't know many years later i think uh, almost after maybe puc or something i kind of realized that uh, i have been sitting on a gold mine of information but doing nothing about it. because a friend of mine uh, he introduced me not rather introduced, he started talking about i used to go for this engineering lessons for uh, amie there one of this friend called sachidanand was there who used to come and discuss ragas with me 
and you should say this is kedar and that is bhopali and one day i just i just pointed out that no this is not kedar and i explained to him then he said how do you know this i said you come to my house one day so he comes to my house and he sees uh, hundreds of instruments all across the house and he was very shocked he said my god you you come from this background and what are you doing with engineering and i was like no no my mother wanted me to be an engineer because my mother felt that music has too much of headache politics should not get into music so that was her opinion so i was kind of prepared for that mentally that okay i would never make music as a prof but my friend asking me this and every other day discussing kind of made me feel that there must be some value to this somewhere in the world hmm. you know if we have not probably realized it or we have gone, gone through a rough patch it doesn't mean that the world is not going to welcome you in that way so that was the very first beginning of the seed of thought that yes maybe i should do something more serious about it hmm. and just then i i just tried something then there was this akashvani audition and suddenly i got a b high grade in it you know because you supposed to get b high grade after 7 or 8 years of exposure so that was automatic and then suddenly i got a chance with iccr to tour i didn't i had not even <laughs> toured too many cities in india and suddenly i was touring europe and um, malaysia and all kinds of countries without even having known my next town you know mm. so suddenly seeing so much of outside world which was very very welcome to indian classical music and they all thought that indian classical music is the amazing heritage which probably i think the indians have only realized very less about yes true. so that realization from the outside world was very powerful you know too powerful to ignore but at the same time i also understood that when i was traveling with other classical musicians i thought that the point of communication was a whole issue you know because classical music is amazing mm. as long as you understand it and you enjoy it but what about conveying the same thought to somebody else mm. because you know i really believe in this concept of uh, i always think very powerfully about mahatma gandhi for this reason i might have certain beliefs i might have certain commitments but how do i convince a 100 crore country about my beliefs and commitments yeah. so that is the greatest message of communication which you probably have to understand that there must be some way of communication by which you convey to such a large mass about the beauty of your subject so that was one of the basic seeds to then start going into different directions to see how the same idea of classical can be reinforced through so many other mediums because i think in indians especially we are so amazing that even when pizza arrived in this country even i think the people who invented pizza would not have thought that there will be a paneer pizza and you know <laughs> mutter paneer pizza <laughs> so i think that's that's the typical genius of indians you know that we bring anything from anywhere and we can make it our own through our own beautiful way yeah and probably we did this with so many other musical forms also because we took everything from anywhere and we made it our own Mm-hmm. so that was one of the very strong uh, thoughts which came, um, came into me that yes we should pursue music with this thought that such a beautiful music such an amazing music such a great heritage has to go to more people there's no point in saying that oh my god i am sitting on a gold mine but you don't care about it mm-hmm. no as unless and until the other person sitting there also feels that gold with his hand and sees oh my god this is really gold all you are talking about your gold is of no value True. so it's about the perceive means how the people are going to perceive this whole art is the biggest uh, story i believe that that's the whole story which is still going on that we are trying even in sma to see how classical music can be enforced in a beautiful way where people enjoy it people think it's something which will empower me with something more you know mm-hmm. not just say okay i want to learn two three raga so that i can sing jabdeep jaliana better you know you know jabdeep jaliana is not the end of the story it's the beginning yeah yeah so that's that was pretty much my you know thought and my parents were, both of them were incredibly uh, dedicated teachers like chaitra says that uh, they would never think like my father used to always say this that you have a geography teacher you have a maths teacher in school if every teacher started thinking that i will teach maths only if this kid shows commitment towards mathematics if the geography teacher says i'll teach geography only if this child says i love geography then all teaching in this world will stop 
Mm. The teaching has to be done with the same commitment that yes, my subject is the most beautiful subject. I have to teach it with utmost sincerity and not think that I will take tests of people for six months, two years and see, is he really going to take up this, you know, nobody here is carrying any sultanate. It's not like, you know, they're carrying a very big sultanate, which you have to take forward. In your own small way, you have to contribute with the most seriousness that yes, I am the biggest torchbearer of this particular thing. Mm. That's all. So if every teacher does it with the same intention, every subject will be equally beautiful because we remember the most beautiful subject as the explanations done by the most beautiful teacher. teacher. Yeah. It's only the teachers whom we remember, sometimes not even the subjects. You know, you'll remember the name of the teacher who taught you that subject so beautifully. Yeah. So of course, now you know the subject, but the teacher stays in the memory because of the teaching. Yes. So that has to be the approach. You can't say, oh, this is not important to him. It's just a hobby. Why should I waste my time? No, you can't say that about any student because you never know when something will awaken in the child and someday and he might do something great with it. Mm -hmm. So we can't be judgmental. Mm -hmm. You have to teach. A teacher's biggest job is to just teach with that most sincerity that, yes, my subject is the most beautiful and I'm going to take this subject into the heart of the child. Mm -hmm. That's all. So I think we both that way, I think, have the same thoughts about it, but yeah. we otherwise keep fighting a lot about other things. <laughs> other things. <laughs> yeah, but uh, all that you said, Prakash, it comes <coughs> with hindsight. Now, when you look back, all of this is what you learned. But while you were there as a young boy with your parents growing up, seeing music all around you, what was it that you were absorbing just passively because it was happening around you or did you understand enjoy and just take it what was happening so no it's in in a musician's house it is so strange that today somebody is learning let us say the basic raga like let us say the beginning raga maybe mm -hmm. it's not no raga is the beginning raga yeah. it's the bhopali somebody is yeah. learning bhopali at a beginning level at a beginning level yes huh. So you learn Bhopali and you are hearing Bhopali today and then suddenly tomorrow you are listening to the, 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 some very serious Darbari. You know? huh. So you are learning and the way you are perceiving things, it's very strange. It's not in a, you know, it's not been uh, classified. This is this, this is this. Everything just goes into you. Hmm. My mother is very smart in this regard. She, she kept putting me through music examinations. My father was the greatest critic about it. He used to say, Are ye exam dene se kya hota hai? Who learns music by examination? You know, I have seen all these arguments happen in my own house. So I can imagine how musicians will react. So my dad used to say, nobody learns music by exams. My mother used to say, whether he learns or not is a different issue. But before an exam, say one month before the exam, he'll at least sit and go through those ragas. But you never protested? You thought that's part of... Uh, no, I was, you know, I was, uh, I was very <laughs> great in the protesting art because uh, I used to slowly side with my father when it became convenient for me and then slowly side with my mother whenever it became convenient. <laughs> but uh, they both, and interestingly, in spite of all this story, there was never a force. Hmm. My dad used to say, Dekho, he is a brag, hai, dekho kya karna hai. and then I would only feel very stupid because I go there and sit down and somebody says, Are you Suntakye ji ka ladka hai? And then suddenly so many people, Oh, Suntakye ji ka ladka hai, oh, we have to listen to him. And then I would suddenly feel, oh my God, so many people are listening to me seriously, for what reason? Like, uh -huh. then Suntakye family, oh. So because my father was in the circles of music, known as a very, very scholarly person. You know, he was very uh, clear about the, the theoretical part of it, the practical part of it. And all top musicians of the country would come and ask him doubts about ragas and all that. So he was kind of known for this. So everybody used to say, Are, Suntake ji ka ladka hai, chalo kuch sunao, dekha ke suna jai. So that suddenly used to put me in a very strange part that, oh my God, people want to listen to me and I'm just being so casual about it. Mm. And not that I suddenly became very serious about it either. But the casualness and the seriousness, a great mix of both kept happening in my life, mm. which is why I felt that uh, I would understand that if somebody is singing something wrong, I would know that this is not happening the right way. But then my dad had told something beautiful that when you are listening to somebody, do not judge mm. when you are listening. Don't get into judgmental mode when you are listening. Listen to the whole thing. And then if you feel that there is something that needs to be discussed, 
you can come and tell me that something I felt was not right. You can discuss that. But do not form an opinion suddenly ki, Arey yaar, this guy doesn't know this raga at all. Don't get into the judgmental. So I think that pace, even to this day, I, when I listen to a youngster or a completely unknown person also singing or playing, I never judge. I never judge and decide, okay, this guy is 5 out of 10 or 2 out of 10. I feel that there is the listening part of the audition is only for the sake of judging where this person can go to yeah. rather than decide where he is. You know? yeah. The whole concept of auditioning and all that. I believe that it's only the beginning to how to take this child into a journey where he, will he be able to sustain or take it up yeah. rather than deciding that, okay, this is all he knows, he can't go any further. I find that most of the musical um, uh, reality shows, competitions, they kind of try to say that, okay, this is where you are. This is your milestone, which is not to our standardization. Mm -hmm. I believe that you have to actually tell that student that you will actually start your journey now. So the, all the test is only to see if you will start. Because even in job sector, you see, people do four years of BE, mm -hmm. then go to a company, and then the company says six months have to learn what to do. So nobody asks, I have four years fees, what did I do? If I had to six months learn what I had to do, that means I didn't know anything. No? Yeah, yeah. Now you know this, you know this, so we know that now if we teach you this, you will understand this. That's all. Yeah. So that is how I looked at most of the... So as, an, this, as a teacher, then as a complete bystander, you know, because uh, I would always, suddenly I put myself as a total bystander and think, okay, if somebody is going to ask me a question about music, what is music? from a bystander's opinion, there are thousands of different definitions. Yeah. It cannot be my scholarly, you know, 20 years of riyaz and, you know, 14 hours a day makes you into an amazing musician. It's not, I'm not doing an ad line. I'm just thinking that why is a bystander asking this question? Ki, Are, what is music? Sir, I Sangeet nahi malum. Sangeet hai kya? So such questions you used to, uh, you know, I used to come across when as a myself, you know, I used to ask this question to myself, ki, what is music, if you have to define it. And as so these curiosities used to make me understand that, yes, there is a different perspective totally to see it from rather than just, you know, the scholarly perspective or the hardworking perspective student, first few years only struggling to do this. Yeah. Then he's struggling to do that. And then he thinks, okay, he has achieved that. So he thinks these struggles are stupid. Then he is going to something next level. So this whole journey, you know, my father used to talk about his Guruji, that is Pandit Omkar mm -hmm. who was a very, 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 uh, you know, what you say, edurite and a very, very scholarly musician who used to start the Sare Gama first for the first student in the college. Sare, you know, the very basic lesson. He never thought that I am such a big scholar, such a big musician. Why should I be sitting with this basic lessons of Sare Gama Padre? So those things remain in the memory mm. that, you know, even the greatest musician thought that the very first basic lesson also has to be taught with the same seriousness. You can't say, ah, these basic things, you know, you can learn from somebody and after 10 years come to me, I'll make you something. That is where our music, I think, suffers from. We need to take it to that level where the biggest performers also have to be the biggest teachers. Obviously, means if you are not a good teacher, in my opinion, you can't even become a good performer. The reverse. People always say, oh, you're a great performer, so you will not be a great teacher. It means I don't un understand the logic. If you have not learned your subject only, you can talk like this. Yeah. If you have learned your subject thoroughly and understood it to be as a true form of expression, you have to be a great teacher and a great performer both at the same time. Okay. <laughs> were both of you always in sync like this? Where did the two of you meet? Yes, of course, you were coming for classes. <laughs> <laughs> so there were classes happening outside the classes for sure. You are such a shy person, Chaitra. <laughs> How did you even talk to Prakash ji? <laughs> I didn't talk to him for a long time. <laughs> tune the Tanpura. Yeah, so I was, my duty was to tune the Tanpura. Like before my mother's class, huh. my job was to go and check if the Tanpura is in tune. Because that time we, all the classes were only through the original Tanpura only. So I used to come to tune the Tanpura and, you know, I was very conscious about the fact that, you know, this is a musician's house and people are coming, girls are coming to learn. It should never happen that somebody says something, oh my God, there's a very vagabond boy there who is troubling girls. 
<laughs> will not even smile. <laughs> so I used to be very serious about my tuning Tanpura. I just tune it and go. That's it. Sure. So for several months we never spoke also. And you are like would... that now also. He doesn't smile like. <laughs> so... That time he was more so. Like... Yeah. So I was I was very serious a person because I would be practicing and usually I was woken up by my mother for these kind of tasks because she would say, "No, finish, stop your practice now. Go and tune the tanpur." So my brain would be in some zone and just come down to another tanpur and go back to that so that I can continue back with it again. So I think that those are the initial memories that she thought that as a very very strict person or something. Notice <laughs> um, me. Till people get to know me, they don't understand who I am because uh, they might see me as a very some kind of a khadus person or something. Then there were times when he used to be playing his violin those days mostly hmm. more than guitar. People hmm. get to hear him practice. So. Nothing of this happened in such a conscious way that it was, you know, like, oh, yeah. We started with some Now discussion. Yeah, I means we were always, we, our topics would always end up with some serious discussions about music. Now also it is the same. In every morning we get up with uh, some serious discussion about music, about what to do for this, what to do for that. And I think, uh, yeah, means that's, we are just blessed, I feel, that we have something to discuss every morning. There's never a day where like we don't know what to do now. Yeah, it's always uh, okay. Like we had to okay. Let me just put us this side thought aside for me to go and get something from the market. It's always like that. Yeah. It's always um, there's something going on cooking in the head all the time. Yeah. Hmm. Then yeah, I think once we called. Um, I called. I had to call him as a judge for a, something that I was organizing in college. Hmm. Yes. That's how. Oh, okay. And and I failed her, okay. her her friends. All of her friends I failed. <laughs> it was definitely not a pleasant moment. I am sure but that. Became your student. Yeah, and but <laughs> that guy became my student later on. That's another interesting story. <laughs> I think these are things which happened. As I never thought that because I have been taken by Chaitra to judge, I had to just keep passing all her best friends. Yeah. That was not my agenda. <laughs> So I could be, I could be that way called as an unpleasant person. No, no, I think it's the uh, love for music and music which finally was the winner okay. that day. So much yeah, before right. ICCR, your uh, exposure to world music was there. Yeah, yeah, because it's, it's my music. house, my house was very close to this in BHU where we used to live, Benares in the mm -hmm. university. Our house is very close to the international guest house, mm -hmm. hardly hundred meters from the international. Hmm. So most of the time we had friends in the international guest house to go and play tennis and, you know, generally we like a Firangi, an hmm. outsider, hmm. we always hmm. were very, in Benares is typical, it's yeah. beautiful that you hmm. see so many outsiders so commonly that it becomes yeah. very common for you. You don't think, yeah. oh, British, hmm. oh, American, it's like they're just hanging around in the ghats, you know. Yeah. So these people had become our friends and I had been listening to so much of Pink Floyd on there on their collections and so I used to be so inspired by Pink Floyd because I found that Pink Floyd exactly was like a mirror image of what I was learning in the house as a raga existing as a totally different platform on some other world. Mm -hmm. So in the rock world, this is something very different, but the same thing is a very simple raga in my system. So that happened that early mm -hmm. where it was not even on a conscious level that yes, I am perceiving this and I am doing something incredible. I never thought about all this. Hmm. I used to go to weddings and I used to be playing totally classical music and I would mix Shine On Your Crazy Diamond or you know, Wish You Were Here in a totally classical piece and everybody will come and say, hmm. So the listener's perspective is very simple. He just listens. Yeah. He doesn't have, you know, genre specifications like now it became this and all. Hmm. So when you play any form of music to a good listener, he just listens. So that is the most important element of music listening in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the beauty of communication and the commonality with music. Both have to touch the heart. And uh, when you know you've touched a person's heart, you know the communication has been done. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I think you did with your music, Prakashji. <laughs> so though you didn't smile, I think your music <laughs> did all the smiling in connection. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's how you are where you are. But with these influences coming in and making you and blending you into the musician that you slowly started evolving to, where did uh, 
the entire process of you moving out and getting the globe to listen to you happen and how did that happen because you're today an international musician <laughs> yeah i mean i think today because of the online world hmm. we are living in an instant on international world you know? correct the online world is literally the international world because once you switch on your camera hmm. you can be seen by anybody in the world anyway yes so that i think the the coming of internet and you know much before i think uh, 2004 people say the credit youtube mm -hmm. i was uh, uploading things on um, you know computers trying to put things as early as 2000 maybe 97 98 itself i used to do lots of video recordings of my own playing and play it up there and that time there is this thing called universal tube which later on became youtube, YouTube so, right? yeah. so so I was uploading content as early as 98, 99, and many musicians used to ask me, like, are you crazy sharing your music? Yeah. My thought was, uh, if somebody wants to play my music, I'm very welcome to that thought because I do, do not feel that I'm the only harbinger of this and I, it will go with me to the grave. It was very stupid of thought. And I should say, good, if somebody wants to play it, let them play. While as in the other classical world, as early as 97, 98, this is totally sacrilege, like putting out your content, anybody can take it and do something. Like, what will they do with it? Let the most. And yes. will they do good justice? Let them. If they do good justice, I will get to know something new. That is my opinion. So in that, I was sharing content that early mm. that by 2005 or 2006, so many of my uh, recordings, which were, you know, shared across the internet, on, that was on the YouTube. Hmm. were uh, getting me shows from unknown countries, you know, I wouldn't even know. And it would happen, which is why I I believe in YouTube so much that I had not even known that there was this very great guitarist who passed away, of course, from Norway. I used to live in this place called Arendal. It's extremely cold. Hmm. You can't, like, minus 35 is normal. Hmm. Such a country. And there he saw my playing on this classical instrument and he sent me a feedback on the YouTube saying that, you know, you have got a uh, great playing style, but I think the instrument which you have is, is is not the best. You should get something better. So I couldn't believe that this is somebody from some other part of the, and I didn't even know where he's from because it was just a straight away comment and, and was, I couldn't even make out where he's from. So I asked him, then he connected me to a couple of these amazing guitar makers in America. I talked to the very first guitar maker about this and he says, you know, my guitars start from $2,000 onwards, you know. So that's unheard of in Indian currency, yeah. like starting from 2 lakhs onwards, basically. Yeah, yeah. So 2 lakhs is starting means it thinks like, okay, it is something which is we are not even going to think about. But six months from then, suddenly a, a concert happens in America. I go for a concert in America. Then I reach out to this guy. I communicate with him. He brings me a guitar and he gives me something. I come back with it, start playing. I, I realize it's incredibly different from all the instruments that I owned before. And that was the beginning of another journey, you know, to getting the right instruments. And yeah. I think um, I could have built a new house easily if I had not been buying this. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, yeah, means, but I never regretted it yeah. because uh, I felt that there is a particular tone of a particular instrument which I wanted and I would want it. And of course, really courageous of Chaitra that she never discouraged me from that. Mm. Though she made faces at that. Um, <laughs> I would go that. <laughs> my, my entire my entire uh, tours budget uh -huh. would would be a new guitar. That's it. I would just come <laughs> back with a new guitar and nothing else. Okay. And she would be like, "What happened?" I said, "I have got a new guitar." And she would be wondering that, "What can we say about the sanity uh -huh. of this man?" <laughs> 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 but yeah, I mean, I think that way she is very, um, she kind of, she supported me in every way. There is no yeah, doubt about it yeah, because yeah. Um, I'm a very, I'm a very crack person. <laughs> I could just be suddenly the whole day sitting with my headphones and just doing something, mm -hmm. not, she might be getting irritated, I know for sure. Even if she says no, I know that. <laughs> but uh, you know, in spite of all I'm that, she just supported no the yeah. She supported the fact that okay, if you have to, because you know, it's a, being an artist and a musician and being a creative person is a, it's a very dangerous self indulgence. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's yeah. a very, very dangerous self-indulgence and it could be sometimes very, you know, it, it could be very irritating for the people around. But uh, she and the kids have been really nice to me. They... But do you draw the lines or do they tolerate you? <laughs> no, I, I have actually, you know, you will be surprised at the amount of democracy in my house. We have surpassed the Indian democracy <laughs> way back. <laughs> so you could understand what it means. <laughs> So in our house, democracy is on a totally different level. My daughter and son can just completely condemn my ideas because whenever I make a new tune, uh, of the, when the process of a tune happening also, she's a very great critic about it. Like I'll make something and I'll be very happy with it and she'll say, oh, the, the kids are not going to like this at all. Huh. And I'll be like, huh? Are, this is such a great tune, why? No, 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 no. Nobody, this is very boring. So it's as you know, at the time saying you know, that people think that, wow, Chaitra just sits and admires whatever <laughs> Prakash ji does, there's no such thing. I should have candid cameras someday and record all these things. And then really the criticism, it's very direct It's and it's never colored, like think of something better. It's not like that, it's boring. And then you realize, oh, okay, maybe yeah. So you have to think about it again. So which is, gets you to get more creative. And she'll always be so right about, you know, like whichever, like with this time we made this tune in nine and a half. Hmm. I was, uh, you know, like, as obviously as an, I'll just be you know, gloating over it for some time. Wow, mm -hmm. what an amazing tune. I'm so mm -hmm. amazing. And then she said, uh, without lyrics, this tune is a waste. Hmm. And yeah, initially I we kind thought of, we'll do some swaras. Yeah, we just thought then, of doing you know, swaras. And then, then it wouldn't go across like how it did. Then yeah, we spoke to Himangi. Have lyrics. Yeah. And you yeah. won't believe that that student Himangi, I don't even know, I don't want to call her as a student. She just made such incredible lyrics and she sent it for the first time. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this whole song got a total new dimension, dimension, which I had totally ignored maybe. But you know, mm -hmm. so that is Chaitra's thought and she will always know what is to be done with that composition in the right way, which students to involve, how to, I mean, it's, it's um, I think Chaitra is a, great master in all those things you know yeah. she'll herself sing and she'll say right no no we have to give it slightly more tougher make it little more tougher for some of you know because students have come to a good level because level. you find you find sms students singing the most difficult compositions with such ease because they have never been told that oh my god i sang this i practiced this for 30 years you listen to stories like that you feel very scared so yeah. but it's not if you don't tell anything to the child and mm. just say i just sing this it's a very they simple tune yeah. they just do it yeah. and which is what i found you know that the communication of chaitra has been like that that it's it's very it's just like pure water you know there is no there's no mm. colors there's no artificiality and she's what she is, which is why the students will always, you know, they'll say, ma'am, we have to practice this properly, ma'am, ma'am, mm -hmm. chalo, chalo, let's do it. So it's never like, no, no, you can't do this, you know, this, this can't do this has never been in any of the dictionaries in our house. Mm. Wow. So Chaitra, coming back to you, as a teacher over the years, now looking back, where do you think you picked that ability to be so patient and just accept them for who they are? rather than you know generally especially with music there are certain paramparas and gharadas which have to be followed and it has to be done like this only but you are somebody who's been very flexible and i would borrow prakash ji's words like water in the sense water takes the shape of whichever vessel you put it in you are able to alter yourself to the student given to you how are you Today, looking back, making yourself so moldable, uh, were there influences that made you that? Or was it something that you learned on the way? How did you pick up to be a teacher like that? I think, I think it's a combination of, of all, mm. uh, definitely of the influences. This is one thing I tell uh, even other teachers who, mm. who, who come and like who are who are working with me in the academy setup or uh, one maybe the key thing that we all have learned from our gurus and yeah. uh, uh, of course i've been lucky to have uh, gurus who have been kind uh, to me and um, 
they accepted me as I as you know as I am or my voice or they didn't make any criticism on the kind of voice or, or they just gave me those they just show, showed me the route to you know to make it better so I think that is one main or major inspiration from my the, the people who taught me and the same I, I say tell the same thing to my teachers too, who are there but if your guru has taken you so you know you should also have the same uh, acceptance to others so what makes me feel that you know i am something very very uh, big or very uh, great or you know uh, something like why why would i go with that kind of a feeling because there at that point the student is the central person because that yeah. you know, the student has come to you with a lot of uh, love for music which you have to only nourish and and each one comes with their own qualities mm. and uh, as a teacher i think you have to um, make them the best uh, form of themselves i think mm. that is the best way mm. to yeah. train them it's rather than um, make them something else or mm. what they are not you have to just uh, see the best of them and Bring keep it nourishing that mm. Bring out the best yeah. in them. Sick. As we move on, what I want to ask uh, Prakash ji, you at this point is the discovery of that slide guitar of yours and your ability to leave such a huge footprint where you've won, you've been part of the Grammy award winning album as well. So the collaboration that happens with so many musicians of different genres, how are you able to still find your space in it and come out of it and walk like nothing has happened or changed in your life. How are you able to carry this so lightly? <laughs> so actually, I'm just so curious. <laughs> I, I really feel that uh, uh, awards, the real purpose of awards is actually to know the other strata of society, which you are not a part of, mm-hmm. to get some awareness about this strata of society. That's all. So as a musician, when you are given an award, an award becomes a headline and people who are not musicians like you or in the same profession or interested in the same profession also get to know about it. An engineer will hear Grammy award. As a musician, I will hear top engineers pick something like that. So these awards are the only way that this communication happens across different status of society and the recognition comes in. So it's just that in my opinion, number one and collaborations. I always believe that um, listening in my opinion is the first quality of collaboration because you know, what happens is I have practiced 25 years of my music. I am already full of gyan. I am the most gyani in this entire and I walk into a studio with this approach. I will not be able to collaborate with anybody. I have to go like a pure clean slate with whom I have to collaborate. Like I do not think about myself at all. I say, okay, what is this person got to offer? Or what is this person wanting to share? That's the first thing which I see. And that is pretty much the last thing also, because that determines how I collaborate with him. You know, so how, because every collaboration is not the same, because in one project, there is a singer songwriter album. In there, I know that my guitar's volume will not be as much as the singer's voice. So I know how much to collaborate so that I play only that much that is required so that it gets some kind of a upliftment for that singing. If she's singing something beautiful, I have to make that singing sound more beautiful through my work. You know, I just can't say, okay, you have heard her now listen to Prakash Suntake and change the whole scenario. No, it's not like that because a collaboration becomes a collaboration genuinely only when everything sounds wonderful. It can't be said that this is a great collaboration of Prakash Nataki and nobody, who knows? It's not, that's, that's not a collaboration at all then. That means I have played all over the album and people are just wondering, wow, you so good. So the, the collaboration is a success when people listen to the whole song in its wholesome self. The whole song's communication, the song, what the song has to communicate. That idea is going through. And if this collaboration has been introduced there, that means the collaboration is successful because it was able to carry that one single idea across perfectly. Mm. Otherwise, it's uh, okay, it's it's a bunch of talented musicians getting together and just jamming. In my opinion, it's, it's all that. 
today in the year 2000 2020 collaborations are completely on the intrinsic level of what the whole project says and how far am i able to carry that whole thought yeah so that is a collaboration remember so you have to be a listener you can't walk into a studio only as a player player and say okay or if it is somebody's production somebody has produced something and say i'm mr santake i just want two bars of slide here thank you that's all means then it's okay it's a production but a collaboration becomes a collaboration when you actually listen to what the other person is saying uh, is that person also stepping out of his boundaries are you also stepping out of your boundaries and then you are meeting at a ground which is very uniquely neutral yeah. to everybody yeah. so a collaboration is successful there where a song is just a beautiful song yeah. you didn't say oh yeah this song was nice it was based out of hindustani classical and little jazz I, I think that's all you know it's just for discussions but the fact is a song success is if people have heard it liked it first then you ask somebody what you liked in that song then after it you can say okay what genre it was so these are all like uh, in descending order so the biggest success of the collaboration is if people are hearing the song liking it that's so i always believe that that's a, like i have recently there in varanasi Mm. collaborating with my friend uh, pravin chaturvedi who makes this uh, moonlight films very popular production house in in banaras so we were given which not he was given this documentary to make on kashi vishnath corridor yeah. and congratulations uh, because <laughs> it's there in uh, the prime minister's handle as well correct, on youtube correct. the whole thought was you know that when i met uh, revati ji she is such a beautiful singer my thought when she shared her composition then she wanted that composition to be there mm. i was so surprised that the composition by itself was so full it was just like i could have just left the voice just there and mm. done nothing with it it was just beautiful because there is narration he is narrating the whole you know yeah. how this whole process happened and then that yeah. voice so then i thought of adding a little bit of fusionish elements of some interesting beats which will come into that picture so that the song is already there it has got its entire message very clear this music of fusion bringing the beats was it just happened so beautifully that that was used as an element of construction how things are getting constructed because construction is a very material like you know mechanical process the mechanical process were there so the the bringing in the beats there automatically looked like it was thought about and just mm. manufactured for that mm. so you know that's what i said he as a music director if somebody has given me like, like okay where do i bring prakash santake here is not ideology the idea is if this song is good enough in itself then i just had to focus on that song and make something else around it to make it look beautiful like you know in sometimes in a painting the main thing stands out in a different color yeah or you want to make that main thing stand out you blur the other colors colors yeah there are different ways of looking at it Yeah. So I always believe that that is my basic philosophy. Ki if a song is being heard for its entirety, we have to see how we can make it more wonderful. So I believe collaboration is all about listening to the other side and seeing what you can do to make that also sound beautiful. And your uh, invention? I just call it Swarvina also for the very same reason that if I will say uh, Prakash Vina, Suntakhi Vina, it's very easy for me to get into that. But I didn't do it because. anybody who wants to play their instrument should play it without having pre you know prejudice preju- uh, some kind of a condition pre condition that okay if you are a prakash santake disciple only you will play prakash veena why should that happen somebody else's disciple also wants to pick up this instrument he should be able to i was not very keen about bringing prakash or santake into the picture because i felt that that will instantly limit the scope of that instrument you know only somebody related to me learning from me my disciple my disciple's disciple you know this whole big legacy talk what is the point if your great legacy talk name is big but is nobody there we don't have hundreds of disciples who are taking our name and doing something with it what's the point there the, the real uh, the proof of the legacy is if there are hundreds of people in that legacy practicing music yeah. doing something with it so i just kept it swarvina the easiest thing for me because then you know again you have to go into the soul copyright world pay some thousands and lakhs of dollars to some lawyer sitting in the world who doesn't care about anything anyway a, <laughs> nobody th- ever thought about who thought about the dia you know? yeah have you ever thought who thought of who owns a copyright for a dia 
टूडे तो यू गो टू गुजरात राजस्थान यू सी देर आर सो मेनी ब्यूटिफुल वेराइटीज ऑफ दिया विच हैव कम इज ए इनक्रेडिबल एम लाइक माई गुडनेस हु थॉट ऑफ दिस डिजाइन दिस कलर सो लेट्स लीव इट एट दैट मीन्स इफ इट इज प्रैक्टिकली यूजफुल फॉर समबडी लेट देम प्ले इट दे डोंट टेक माई नेम I don't care because there is no name associated with the name. Anyway. Because the guy who made it for me, he kept asking, "Don't, don't do all that. Just anybody picks it up, just give it to them. Or whatever you want to charge, that minimal charge you charge and give it." So many people in Chennai would pick up that instrument, then call me slowly and say, "Sir, I picked up this Swarvina." So I was very happy that okay, good, you are doing something good with it. That's all. And I have never given it a second thought. Also that. should i have associated my name with it and all. it doesn't that thought only doesn't come and in a world today where everybody is so noisy and worried about their names being visible they being visible and people remembering them the two of you stand out for me because you make your work speak and at a time when people say work alone is not enough you have to talk about your work <laughs> how would you talk about the changing times <laughs> no i think we are coming to a point of time in the in every culture today where there is over information yeah. we are living in a world of over information battling with misinformation you know because for everything people just go and say oh i'll i'll check google google <laughs> i always tell them that listen there must be something which google doesn't know yeah and i'm sure i know that so come to me no i mean i'm not being critical about google i'm very happy that google does that because yeah. it's when when we were kids if you remember we had to do research we would walk into yeah. a library library yeah walk into the row yeah. if it was science walk into the science row there are what i am looking for ah this is my book and then yeah. when i'm picking out that book uske agal bagal mein na something next to it and something next to it yeah. and something yeah. two next to it three next to it yeah i would have the time to ah oh, this is nice ah what is this so that additional information curiosity got killed because of google yeah i want mean, what is now this what is navaras tak navaras ah yes <laughs> i know it so and then tomorrow somebody some scholar talks about navaras for one hour he'll be like what is this guy talking about one hour that is just a line in google so we have to get out of that uh, world of uh, misinformation and over information and make focus because it, see it's these are all things which go on lifelong you keep learning because even now just yesterday i was talking to somebody and i realized ki oh this could be such a good way of teaching somebody who is not able to catch pitch because you know i used to have a student who used to um, be um, like absolutely no idea of pitch but he used to sing wonderfully whatever he sang because he had heard things from childhood and he would sing it so based on his singing i thought wow i have found the student of my lifetime you know this student is going to make me immortal in history and i got this student to my house and i started teaching him and first today of saring up and this i was in tears myself like i was so 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 i was like what's he doing how you get big how is this guy possibly singing what he sings so beautifully so it was a big shock and then i realized at some point of time that i could teach him through you know conversation say hello so he would say hello ha huh. ha huh. sa da da sa ne da pa so i would catch him on words you know pick out words and just then i like when i was conversing with somebody i just remembered this that i could teach him only through words hello how are you hello he would, he would catch that mm-hmm. so through that i taught him for 6 7 8 months and then he would do sa re ga ma pa da ni sa correctly so my greatest journey for those 8 months was to get him to do sa re ga ma pa da ni sa from the pitch that i wanted not he so i just remembered that you know co- using that conversation as a medium of teaching now i was initially as a instrumentalist i was be very disrespectful towards lyrics i wouldn't say disrespectful <laughs> just the fact that i was like what is there in lyrics here the tune is everything because that's what happens to you as a instrumental artist because you are playing a yeah. medium which doesn't have any words yeah. so you start appreciating the wordless medium much more and then gradually over the years i understood the importance of the words the communication with words too and still to this day you know i sometimes feel that it's such a great learning in this document adiyana adiyananta apa when the lyrics are sent to me i was just thinking how will i describe adi anadi ananta apa means it's all about explaining infinity in just one line and it is shiva himself singing yeah so i then this thought 
ki how to bring infinity through words mm. and the tune also the blend of both ultimately mm. so jaitra will always say uh, your lyrics are always going for a toss <laughs> you know, it's, it's a fact <laughs> and i accept it because uh, but now i am very conscious i'll always ask jaitra that please tell me where i am going wrong we are in that part of the conversation you've given a lot of your time with the last two parts of the conversation one is on uh, the pandemic which has been reflective for the whole world a lot has shifted for the world has anything shifted for the two of you in the last two years when it comes to live music or performing live yes it it does make it did you know make an impact where there is no direct communication as performers or performing artists the whole experience where you are on stage with other uh, artists maybe the tabla playing and, and the instruments playing and we used to do a lot of collaborations live also like some shows like ragas everywhere and all like yeah yeah a lot of that was missed uh, during pandemic so everything came online and it was uh for live performances it was again a, a, a whole new story of where you know you, you make um, adaptations with all the technology and everything but the second part of it the teaching part was not much affected because i think shankar mahadevan academy thought ahead of times so we were online from the last 10 years like mm-hmm. as you know we, we are celebrating a 10th year so that was a thought which uh, shridhar and shankar ji thought i mean long that back many years back when people were not people were like totally dismissing this whole thing of <laughs> learning music online and that to a classical form of music uh, i think with the coming of pandemic a lot a lot more people joined or like they, they came they got in touch with us or, or we kind of expanded uh, that way they became more accepting to the thought and idea of online learning so we could um, i think we could make an impact uh, and mm-hmm. uh, contribute maybe in a significant way i think so, yeah, I so think, i'm really happy about you know, that if, if you if you had to study about uh, the pandemic i guess uh, there are two three points of time in history when say post world war you know if you study post world war phase how people reacted and so there is a saying which i don't know whether it is saying or it's, it's a, which is a kind of a research which says that after this life changing experiences the value of life increases so when pandemic comes in like post world war everybody wanted to live get married have children because they had seen the you know the mammoth destruction which was caused by war then the spanish flu so if you study all those then there's a cultural renaissance which happens within the society because people now start valuing what they have and not valuing what they don't have yeah. because what they don't have is anyway not going to matter what they have is life yeah. so how do you celebrate life in itself you know because uh, there are so many things which um, are being done today like uh, yoga being used as a cure for so many things so these thoughts are unthought of before you know like so nobody would have thought that cancer could healing. be uh, you know uh, removed by healing so yeah, the yeah. factor of healing has come into the factor of life and it it happens in every society that first you have to run to make you know the the bread and butter and then after the bread and butter you start thinking okay what do i do next so in those lines i think the pandemic has come as a very rude shock to society yeah. where everything has been thrown you know to the wind and you don't know and then sudden, suddenly from scratch you have to completely restructure your life so i feel that is where arts and culture bring in the real value for restructuring yeah the restructuring of the life happens only when you have arts in your life yeah. because you could be doing anything even if you get upset about the smallest thing you don't know what to do with it and you know it's a very very negative space when you don't know what to do and it could take you into any direction sure you know sure. so that's where arts really brings in that factor of how to value your life for what you have the rather than regret for what you don't have so i think like whenever i studied i'm like somehow just by chance it happened that i studied spanish flu then you know the post war and then i found that there is a strange renaissance which happens after all these things 
so you value life mm. so i think that's the greatest thing to because uh, in our day to day life we rarely value life yeah because you're so busy to just sleep for after the day's job and get up for the next morning's job that when did life pass in between these phases we don't know true true so time for pondering has come and a lot of time for pondering the last two years i think lots of pondering has happened mm. and brought people closer to understanding life so it's good it's good in one way that you realize that yes life is something to be taken more seriously than just a discussion yeah you you're very right prakash ji because there are two things that even the media found out and they called it the great resignation where people just <laughs> randomly quit their job why because of the pandemic epiphany which was all about understanding the value of work life balance mm. and suddenly people realized that i have a choice <laughs> it's my life and like you said it just passed now i might as well value what i have and that's very true and as we're talking about life three life lessons that i would like uh, each of you to leave us with be who you are keep at what um, you believe in and always have faith in uh, in what in your own belief and you know keep working towards it so what comes out of it is is a, is a different thing you know without giving much thought to where it is taking me or what am i getting out of it whatever you give uh, comes back to you in a very yeah. beautiful way beautiful way yeah. so she is done with her prakash <laughs> minus <laughs> minus always one thing is always be a, an excited student because uh, you don't know suddenly what lessons you might just get without you realizing that you are getting one so be excited about that learning so that is i think pretty much i feel that's the only way i get across life every morning i'm sure that there will be something exciting for you to get up with. number 2 number 3 no just just keep at it because it's very natural that um, questions like that will come across in your life very often that um, is this anything valuable you can never determine when something will be valuable you know and uh, definitely like if if you are trying to measure value only in certain parameters that you have heard the society recommending as parameters then you might be wrong It means better not to determine what determines value so leave that just the same lage raho you know just today i was listening to an audio book and the first statement of the audio book was words are very powerful mm. and when there is a word spoken by you somewhere there is a universal blessing to that word and therefore be as positive as possible because mm. the word has that power to put positivity and spread it across because you have a choice of what you use <laughs> and i feel that is where both of you for me are perfect in your choice of being positive about whatever you're putting out there and not worrying about what are you getting in return which makes you amazing as people and just stay blessed chetra and prakash ji continue doing what you're doing and may the lord bless you with whatever your wishes are and grant you that because people like you are very rare and i think we need people like this to just continue to tell the world that be yourself you will find a day and a place for yourself so thank you very much for being on you and i with rashmi shetty it was such a pleasure hosting both of you really a pleasure for us rashmi and i saw some of the other interviews also and i felt that you always encourage people to uh, be themselves and you know come up with what they have to say rather than guiding them through it Yes. So I think that's a beautiful approach to you know that's actually that's the only right approach I feel to get people to be themselves. Yeah, so, because each one of us is very unique, Prakash ji, <laughs> and uh, like both of you, each one brings their own individuality, and you and I stands for that. The whole purpose of the conversation is to draw the uniqueness and individuality each yes. one of us carries in this journey called life. 
and mm-hmm. that's what makes our journeys very different from each other but still we blend at the end and that's the beauty of it all <laughs> yes, thank you very much and very very happy new year to the two yeah, of you yeah oh yes and god bless both of you to achieve whatever you want to achieve bye 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 With that we come to the end of this weekly quest of you and I with Rashmi Shetty. Do let us know if you know people who make the world beautiful. Write in to rashmi.thethirdeye@gmail.com. That is r a s h m i dot t h e t h i r d e y e at gmail.com. Come Let's explore this amazing world together, both you and I.